Okay, we are on live and I think successfully. Sort of. can, you, can you, you can hear me, I can hear you, I think we're good. Yes. So welcome folks, uh, trickling in here, we're a little late starting. Uh, we had some, both of us had some mic and cam issues, but we got to sort it out. Um, and we are here for another edition of our first Wednesdays with Savas BD authors. And I'm super excited to have Meg Groling. Uh, I'm pronouncing that right. Meg yes. Groling. Okay. Groling. Uh, on tonight to talk about your recent book on Elmer Ellsworth, which is pretty cool stuff. And I'm really excited to talk to you. And, and uh, he's somewhat, uh, I don't want to say mysterious figure, but, but I think there's a lot that's unknown about him. And it's okay. nice to have new, new scholarship out and because we all recognize him, but we don't, we don't really know. The, the story of who he was and why he mattered and so on. So I think it's going to be a fun uh, chat for our audience tonight to hear about that. And anybody, as you go here, if you have questions, just drop them in the comments and I can relay them to Meg as we go. Um, if there's anything that she talks about or anything that goes along. Um, but why don't we start off with um, just a little bit about you, um, how, you got started in history and Civil War history in particular, um, and maybe you know a little bit of that kind of background here, why this is a passion. Um, and then we can, at the end, tell us why Ellsworth, how that, came, how that <laughs> fell into your lap. Okay, I've always been a Civil War fan, raised by a, a Confederate grandmother, although after I dug around in Ancestry.com, I realized um, she'd been lying to me all those years. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, even in high school, uh, you know, I loved history. I did a lot of uh, work outside the classroom in history. Um, but my dad told me, and um, I guess this is just, uh, I have to tell people I'm really old, <laughs> um, that I couldn't make a living as a historian and a writer mm -hmm. and that I would better find something else to do. So I became a, a school teacher and I taught math. I taught fifth grade for a long time mm. and then taught math. And uh, before I retired, um, I just decided if I was going to do anything, I'd better do it. And mm -hmm. I uh, was, uh, you know, thought, well, I'm going to do the, do the Ellsworth biography and um, got to the point where I found emerging civil war online mm -hmm. and ask them if they, uh, you know, if I could submit a piece for them. Sure. And uh, I did that. The piece was on Ellsworth. And it was very well received. And Chris and Chris are just wonderful to work with. And mm. it's been uh, since 2011 that I've been writing for Emerging Civil War now. Oh, that long. Okay, well. And, um, well, kind of in between time, I had to maintain a career uh, deal with Common Core coming into math because I didn't mm -hmm. teach history. I taught math. Um, and that was uh, both wonderful and, and horrible. And uh, I, um, I also got a master's degree. After I finished the first draft of uh, Elmer Ellsworth's book, I decided, you know, this, this could have some legs. And mm -hmm. I don't want the back to say, uh, retired math teacher and Civil War buff. I wanted some academic credentials. Um, mm, I see. And so I went to APU and got a, a master's in military history. Best decision I ever made. Wow. Uh, it's just been incredible the amount of people I've uh, met that way. I had professors whose books I already had on my shelves. Uh, I, I met wonderful people, even though it was online, you know, mm -hmm. the people that I still am in contact with. Sure. So. Sure. Yeah, it's a great, um, I, I think it's a tremendous era to be a historian now with that. I do too. With the digital access to, to not just the resources, which is great and it enables me, and, and like you living in California, we are so far removed from physical paper archives and things that it's you know, it, to have access to what we do from that way, but the networking and the, the relationships and especially the last two years uh, with everything being so, virtual. Uh, it's th Thank goodness for my computer. Um, yeah. You know, I felt like before I even met Chris Mikowski that, you know, he was already a friend. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I felt like I've, I've connected with a lot of people that the relationships have gone just beyond sharing historical information and, 
uh, in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really been great. And I like you, you know, later, of course, 10 years later, but uh, have also been working with Emerging Civil War. Uh, and that's been what a resource it's been and getting to know those people a little bit virtually again. Um, but that support network and, and everything that they provide to a young, younger up and come, not, I mean, I'm not young, but uh, people are coming at history well, from different angles and different backgrounds and enabling us to do things if we're not coming from a traditional academic pipeline. Um, I think that's, that's one fantastic. of the things that I have to- that I have to say about emerging civil wars, it didn't matter that him, that, to them that I was an old lady. You yeah. know, it, it, nothing like that mattered. They were interested in the history. Could yeah. I write it? Could I think it? Could I talk yeah. about it? And could they help me? And everybody that I have ever talked to that's had anything to do with the emerging civil war knows what a tremendous resource this is for yeah. the history community. Yeah, I, I would say for sure it's, 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 a wonderful asset to, to all of us and, and the people that read it. I get lots of comments from the people that uh, learned about it through, you know, they wanted to read what I had written and then they're like, they subscribe to the emails. They're like, wow, this is, this is a fantastic thing and it's accessible to everybody and it's not, you know, everything comes in portions that you can digest it. And it's, yeah, it's a wonderful <laughs> thing. Uh, so <laughs> now why going back to, to Ellsworth, um, what was what was it about him that you thought I I want to go deep on on this subject or or this man or this approach <laughs> this biography like where, what what well, reeled you in? I knew I wanted to write about something that hadn't been written about too much before. You know, I'm not sure I have anything new to say about Grant or Lee or Gettysburg. Sure, uh, sure. I, I was looking for something that really hadn't been dealt with, but I hadn't made any decision one way or the other. And I got a new job at um, E.E. E. Brownell Middle School. Now, hmm. okay, okay, that's a big name if you know anything about Ellsworth. The man who killed James Jackson, who is the man who killed Ellsworth, his last name was Brownell. Hmm. And uh, here's this, uh, uh, there's a picture of uh, Brownell from the 1940s, and he just signed it, E.E. E. Brownell. Um, we were having uh, parent conferences and I was the new kid on the block sitting at my table and the principal came by, you know, just make small talk. And I was sitting underneath this picture of E.E. Brownell and he's, you know, the principal's trying to make nice and he says, oh, E.E. Brownell. Hmm. I wonder what E.E. stands for. And without even thinking, I said, well, it's got to be Elmer Ellsworth. And my principal turned around and looked at me and I turned around and looked at him turned out he'd been a a civil war buff like forever Mm -hmm. (laughs) and nobody else on the faculty was a civil war buff and it just turned into a you know a a job made in heaven for me Mm -hmm. um it was his encouragement to get the master's degree it was his uh, ability to work schedules to provide me with the opportunity to do the work that i needed to do to get the master's degree Mm -hmm. um it just couldn't have been better. And it sort of, you know, I decided, well, I, I think I'm, I think I'm going to go with Ellsworth. So. Yeah. And yes, uh, the, the man was named Elmer Ellsworth Brownell and he's a distant cousin of Frank Brownell who shot the man who shot Ellsworth. So. Wow. Well, there's a guy here. Um, I work uh, with one of our local historical societies and museums and on the property, there's a building uh, there's, there's a number of old uh buildings that had been moved onto this park property that houses the museum and the original schoolhouse and the cabin, that kind of stuff. Well, one of the buildings is a, <clears throat> belongs to a doctor named E.E. E. Lytle. And of course it's Elmer Ellsworth Lytle. And for, I've been trying to figure out why, you know, <laughs> why did, why did they choose to name him? Did he have a connection with him? That's from something to do with Illinois or New York or what was it? And I could never really find anything other than that he was just simply named after the guy. And so, uh, after Ellsworth died, the, there was a huge outpouring of grief in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was the first, the first time that the Civil War had really touched a lot of those states. We think of the Civil War, uh, you know, if you have to think of it geographically, well, there's Washington in the middle and then south. And you don't think, well, you know, yeah, I can see New York or I could see Chicago. But, you know, if you live in Maine, you know, what's the mm. Civil War? It's nothing. Um I just mess they're doing in in Washington, uh, and 
so when he did his tour of the U.S. Zouave cadets, he went through all of those states. It was a 20 city tour, but he drove, uh, took the train through a lot of the smaller towns that uh, came out and waved to him. And he became what for that time period would be equivalent to a rock star. Yeah. And the newspapers just talked about him and everything was wonderful. And, you know, it's Elmer Ellsworth and da da da. And yeah. Uh, luckily for Elmer Ellsworth, he's also very handsome and very I was going to say, he's a, and... <laughs> he's a photogenic guy for sure. Yes, he is. <laughs> yeah, and his um, engravings, you know, he's a handsome dude, so I can see. Yeah, and and the the people he picked for the uh, Zouave cadets were equally handsome and, uh, uh, you know, compelling. Yeah. But when Ellsworth died now, the whole Northeast knew who Elmer Ellsworth was, mm. and the the uh, fire zouaves, the 11th New York fire zouaves had become such a famous unit for uh, good things and for bad things. They were, sure. I mean, what can you do with a bunch of uh, Irish firefighters from New York? You know? yeah. um, well, let's, but, uh, it was, it was real important that Ellsworth get honored and lots of kids were named, lots of cities were named, streets were named, yeah. towns, you know. Well, there's, so I'd like to start by having you give us a little background on him leading up to uh, his tour with the cadets. And we don't have to get too too deeply into it, but perhaps his roots, because he comes from a very inauspicious and dif very difficult uh, upbringing, really. And his, his, when I read about his time as a young man before, you know, when he's falling in love with the, the, the love of his life, and he's just reminds me of how it felt like when I was in college, where he's like, he had 25 cents and he had to figure out how to eat for a week. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, didn't have the benefit of, of ramen. So he just didn't, he, he, you know, to achieve the level that he did, I think it's important to know about where, where he started at and how he got there. So maybe just for, you know, a, a, a minute or two here, you can get us from I'll, him and through up right up until he's, he's touring. I'll, with I'll the watch the, the time. One of the things that I think is so compelling about Ellsworth is that he was not much different than a whole bunch of other Yankee men, uh, Yankee little boys who were becoming young men. Um, Ellsworth's parents weren't poor. They were working class. Mm -hmm. uh, Ellsworth's uh, father always owned the property. You can check the tax mm -hmm. records. He paid taxes. He owned the properties that they lived in. And um, there was the idea in the North that if you wanted – no matter what you wanted, you could go west, young man, you know, mm -hmm. be a be a self-made man. And Ellsworth, uh, El Elmer was not willing to wait around and let things happen to him. He didn't want to be a butcher like his father was. Um, he wanted to uh, see what he could do with this military stuff. He was an excellent student in school. Uh, he was a, a fabulous artist. And when he was 14, he got a job on a train the, that job led a couple of years later to going to New York. He worked behind a counter at a, a dry goods store. Um, and then from there, he fell in with uh, some engineers uh, and drew for them uh, you know, the, the maps and everything that, that they were doing. And they ended up getting sent to Chicago. So he ends up going to Chicago with them. And Chicago is a city made in heaven for a self-made man. Uh, it's not old like New York. It's not far mm -hmm. away like San Francisco. It's just mm -hmm. um, like Goldilocks. It's perfect, um, right right like it is. And it's an up-and-coming city, and everything's new, and everything's exciting. They called it the Lightning City because it was growing so fast. Um, a self-made Yankee man at that time, and this is kind of yeah, when you start looking at the men who filled the ranks of the Union Army uh, and the men who officered at lower levels, uh, those ranks, you see people like Ellsworth all over the place. Um, they come to these cities. There is at that point no place to get your hair cut, no place to buy clothes, no place to live, no place to buy food already made. And um Things that we think of as existing now, like the YMCA, like, uh, you know, the famous, uh, you know, lunch at the bar. You know, if you bought a beer, they gave you a free lunch. Uh, mm -hmm. all, all of those things, you know, places to go get your uh, your hair done. All of those 
um, uh, support industries came uh, almost, you know, on the heels of the young men who came to um, the the big cities, you know, Chicago mm-hmm. and New York and um, San Francisco. And Elmer was one of those. He uh, got a job as a, a patent, not attorney, but he kind of ran patents back and forth um, between mm-hmm. a patent office and uh, where they uh, needed to go to get okayed by the government. Um, and uh, made friends there and got involved with the Chicago militia. The militia was one of the things that had been pretty much dormant until these young men sort of kind of deluged the city. And then these guys had to find a, something to do between, uh, you know, the time work ended, the time work started again the next day. And they didn't want to go to the whorehouse and they didn't want to go to the bar. They wanted to do other things, you know. So um, uh, that's when libraries began to be open late at night. That's hmm. when uh, groups like the militia group uh, recruited young men to come to um, the armory. The armory was a, a big building where they could come and meet together and drill together. And usually the, um, they had libraries there too. Uh, so these were the, the YMCA where Ellsworth stayed for a long time, uh, offered exercise classes. He learned to fence there. He learned the zoob drill there because mm-hmm. a uh, little older man who was remaking himself came from the Crimean War and uh, taught classes at the Y. So it's kind of all the things we think of as, you know, well, isn't that just what happened? Well, no. Um, he was part of that group for whom they happened for the first time. Hmm. And so what was the 856, 58, something like that? Is that when he's there yes, around that yes. time? Okay. And he uh, turned out to be such an incredible drill master. He had always had a group of friends and they were always, you know, making up, uh, you know, let's play army kinds of things, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and so he knew the Hardee's drill and he knew Scott's drill. Those are the two drills used by the um, uh, the army you know, at West Point. He knew mm-hmm. those and he was learning the Zouave drill, which is what wouldn't look so different to us now from what special forces does. Um, mm. But it, 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 Let's uh, suffice it to say they didn't line up in a line and all point their guns at the same thing and shoot at the mm-hmm. same time. It was much more uh, uh, mobile than that. Yeah. And uh, so he started drilling the Chicago Zouave cadets and they uh, they got real good. Prior to this uh, influx of young men, militias had been places where you kind of met to drink and march in a parade and that kind of thing. Well, he brought the militias back as a, a viable part of the town uh, identity. So he did that. So how how common was the use of Zouav manual and Zouav drill at that point? When he's adapting it. Is he, is he a really early figure in bringing this to U.S. Very military? early. He's okay. an a- absolute innovator in this. And okay. he manages to be able to combine what he knows about all of the drill with the, the, the Zouab drill. Okay. So um, it turns out that his group can uh, go between or among all three um, types of drill. And they did uh, wonderful things like they would do a drill. Uh, it's called a tap drill where the only thing giving them instructions as to what to do is the drum. Hmm. Um, or uh, call and response drills, all kinds of different things like that. And um, he put on a good show. Hmm. And the the men, young men who were in the militia company thought very highly of him. It was uh, also a a real good thing. You know, young man about town should be, you know, have a, a, a militia company that he goes to. And, you know, it was the thing to do. And Elmer Ellsworth's influence made that, um, very it, uh, it was an important thing to do in chicago for sure mm. so speaking of chicago in illinois i know we're going to bring uh president lincoln into this at some point uh that relationship factors into a lot of the, the commemoration and the memory of of ellsworth after his death of course should we should i ask you about his 
touring with the Zuavs? And you, you said how they, they became so popular around the Northeast and all these cities. Is that before or after Lincoln? And where does where did these personalities start to come together? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't set my my phone up well enough there. Uh. <laughs> they it was a, a dovetail. Um, they uh, uh, the Chicago Zouave cadets drilled, and they uh, would show up at um, county fairs and and things like that. And they would have uh, drill competitions. And Ellsworth's guys always blew everybody else out of the water. And at uh, one of the uh, Illinois State Fairs, they won a stand of colors. Uh, it means uh, a whole group of flags mm -hmm. that they were the, the best drill team in the country. Um, I suspect somebody in the South might have argued that point. But uh, so, um, in fact, people did argue and they said, well, you know, you didn't go up against everybody in the country. So the first thing that Ellsworth did was um, put out an ad asking people to come and, you know, challenging him, them to, you know, hmm. you know, fight for the colors. Well, nobody responded, <laughs> you know, after I have to look at the time here, it's just the year 1859, 1860, and a lot's going on. Ellsworth has been hired now um, throughout the last couple of years to go to different areas in, in, in the Illinois, greater Chicago area, I guess you would say, and uh, drill local drill teams. And they would always get real good. And then his contract would be up and he would go to another place and drill. And um, that's how he met the love of his life. And uh, uh, although he was uh, uh, well connected in the drill team uh, era strata there um mm -hmm. and knew lots of political movers and shakers he still wasn't making very much money so mm -hmm. uh his um uh, future father-in-law said well you can't marry my daughter until you can support her and you can't support her as a, a you know someone who you know, goes from contract to contract and uh you know drills guys you know, in funny uniforms, that's not going to work, you know. So yeah. he said, okay, I'll be a lawyer. Now, being a lawyer at that time period meant that you studied with a lawyer. You didn't necessarily go to law school. And uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, this I'm going to study to be a lawyer shows up several times, not only for Elmer Ellsworth, but for John Hay and George Nicolay as well. Um, those were the two men who were uh, Lincoln's private secretaries. Um, so Elmer Ellsworth decides that he's going to uh, gonna get this whole drill team thing really nailed down. He wrote a, a, a book um, so that other, other drill teams could use it and he didn't have to show up to drill them anymore. And uh, they got Zouave uniforms, which were just lovely. He finagled people to pay for his way on the uh, uh, trains and uh, if uh, any water transportation put them up at hotels and he arranged all by himself a, a 20 city tour of the of the northeast and uh, the 20 city tour wasn't just you know podunk it included west point he performed at the mm. presidential mansion um, all kinds of uh important places like that and um, no matter where he went they were received like the rock stars they were everybody thought he was wonderful uh the, the uh, excitement that he brought with them john hay describes it really well this is in, in the book also so if you picture um a trail and Elmer Ellsworth goes down the trail, and as Elmer Ellsworth goes through, in back of Ellsworth, the lights go on. And they start, um, because of Elmer Ellsworth's um, influence, they realize that, yes, in fact, we are going to have a war. Uh, the army's too small. They're going to call for volunteers. We'd better do something to make sure that the uh, United States Army is a, a viable uh, concept here. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so once the Zouaves had been there, uh, things just really started to, to cook. Um, so he, like I said, he, he goes up through New York and down the Hudson. And, um, well, he goes up to Boston and 
and finally goes uh, on down through and uh, into Washington and over back to Illinois, uh, thankful to be home. Uh, anybody who's ever toured for anything knows, you know, at the beginning, it's wonderful. And at the end, it's like, oh, geez, you know, <laughs> I always picture Ellsworth going, hello, yeah. what town is this? You know, <laughs> um, and so Springfield, which is the capital of Illinois, is one of the the second to the last show on their uh, agenda. And they're practicing uh, in the the sort of a big field outside uh, the confines of uh, downtown Springfield. And Mr. Lincoln decides he's going to take his boys and watch them practice. At this point, Elmer Ellsworth knows anybody who's anybody in the political field. I mean, he has just made amazing contacts because mm -hmm. These guys also want to start a war and they mm -hmm. need an army and they know that each state's going to be asked to provide a certain number of soldiers. And if they can get their uh, their citizen soldiers, uh, you know, their first with the best, then everything's going to be better for them. And um, apparently also Elmer Ellsworth was just a real nice, personable guy mm -hmm. and completely trustworthy and honest and, you know, everything you'd want. So he's got his guys out there, and uh, uh, one of the uh, important people in Springfield says to um, Abraham Lincoln, you ought to meet this guy, Ellsworth. You know, you'd, you'd really like him, I think. Um, and so uh, Ells Ellsworth is introduced to Lincoln. Now, of course, Lincoln at this time is already thinking about a run for the presidency. Mm -hmm. And he looks at what Ellsworth has to offer as far as publicity and charisma, and he thinks Elmer Ellsworth might be a good person to get to know. Mm -hmm. And turns out that, in fact, Elmer Ellsworth is an excellent person to get to know. And he starts talking with Mr. Lincoln, and he's there a couple of days before he gets back to Chicago. And Lincoln says, um, he explains to Lincoln why he's got to stop being a drill drill instructor and he's got to learn to study law and Lincoln says come study law with me hmm. I mean can you imagine <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> things fell into Ellsworth's lap it was just incredible so um, Ellsworth goes to Chicago um, turns the Chicago Zouave cadets uh, who were at this time called the U.S. Zouave cadets over to the mayor of Chicago and uh, then goes back and starts um, uh, studying law in Springfield with, uh, with Abraham Lincoln. Well, wow. And from there, um, now, I don't, I guess, I don't understand Ellsworth and don't know him as well as you do, but for somehow I don't <laughs> imagine him being a political speaker. He just doesn't, you know, doesn't, uh, someone who's a commanding officer and a drill officer kind of guy. But I know that that, becomes a thing for him as Lincoln is he's campaigning a great and speaker apparently um he uh he just yeah you know, it's the kind of thing that by the time I finished the book I thought I wish I knew I wish I knew Elmer Ellsworth uh, he just seems like a <laughs> that just sounds so weird to say a really nice man you know mm. um he didn't have any of those mm, yeah, but, you know, that so many yeah. of them of them do. And he was a, a true believer in democracy and uh, and Lincoln. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of uh, the song for Lincoln and Liberty, too. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he's kind of kind of that guy. But yeah. he gets involved in the campaign at the in Chicago to nominate Lincoln. And if you don't if people out there don't know anything about the 1860 uh Republican convention, just give yourself a permission to have an entire summer and a bunch of books because that is probably one of the best stories in all of American history. You know, heroes, villains, uh, just, just, it's just amazing. And one of my favorites out of this is Ward Hill Lehman, who is uh, somebody that, if I had the time, and I don't know if I will or not. Um, Someone needs to do a good book on Ward Hill Layman, too. Anyway, um, Layman is everything Ellsworth is not. Ellsworth is 5'8". Layman is 6'4". Um, Ellsworth is young and cute and impressionable. And Layman is 
you know, he's a, he's a trickster. He's a dirty trickster. You know, he and uh, uh, Lincoln met when they were practicing law on the circuit in, uh, in Illinois. And um, they, they get all involved with uh, the, the people who ran Ellsworth, Ellsworth, Lincoln's campaign. And uh, David Douglas is a campaign manager. He's about a 300 pound guy and, you know, a real political mover and shaker, you know. And uh, so he kind of says, well, we need to get uh, get some things going after all he had been um, out shouted the day before at the uh, convention center, the wigwam. So Elmer Ellsworth knows all the good guys. Ward Hill Lehman knows all the bad guys. They mm. get together. They decide uh, through a little finagling that they can get the um, uh, vote put off a day, uh, and uh, which is what happens is Ward Hill Lehman steals the voting ballots and then says, uh, there's a mistake on here. Uh, these will have to be reprinted. They go, oh, that'll put us behind by a day. And uh, Ward Hill Lehman goes, well, that's all right. We'll 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 deal with it. So he manages to get the <laughs> get them some time, buy them some time. So uh, Ward Hill Lehman goes to all the bars and speakeasies and whorehouses and uh, back alleys and grabs everybody he can, gives them all tickets to the, uh, uh, the convention. And... Um, Elmer Ellsworth goes to all the militias and all the local bands and everything. And so by the time they all show up at the same place at the same time, here are all these, you know, sketchy people from Chicago and they're met with bands and waving flags and wide awakes and everything. So it all looks totally on the up and up and they get into the wigwam before, um, uh, Seward's folks get in there and, um, manage to get, uh, Abraham Lincoln voted on the third ballot. So um, then they go right back to Springfield and John Hay, who is another handsome young man, and Elmer Ellsworth take to the stump. And it's just an amazing experience for both of them. They're well-spoken. They have a good sense of humor. They can play with words. If you've read anything Ellsworth has written, it's he writes beautifully. He has an incredible speaking voice. And, of course, John Hay. I mean, you know, do I need to say more? Um, and if I do need to say more, you ought to, whoever you are out there, need to go find out about John Hay. <laughs> I, yeah. I really don't think you can understand Abraham Lincoln until you understand Hay and Ellsworth and, uh, and Nicolay and his mm -hmm. relationship with these three young men. It's just mm -hmm. an amazing uh, um part of Lincoln's life that for some reason has been ignored for, for far too long. Mm. So anyway, they, well, the, the vote comes and uh, El Elmer Ellsworth is there on the night of the vote and they, they go down to the after party, you know, and um, uh, Lincoln's running across the street to the Western union. And finally uh, Pennsylvania's votes come in for Lincoln. And then finally New York's votes come in for Lincoln. And it looks like, Looks like Lincoln's got it. And uh, um, so the after party actually takes place at a small ice cream parlor and the uh, refreshments are sandwiches and cakes that Mrs. Lincoln's friends have made. Wow. And so wholesome. that's kind of <laughs> it. Uh, that's the last time anything like that ever happens because at that point it, you know, everything goes into overdrive. So. Wow. So in this, with the time in mind, um, I think we'll have to sort of fast forward a little bit. Cause of course I want to get to what happens to him in Alexandria as soon as we can. Um, yes. And then his, his legacy and the commemoration and, and his sort of status that he, he takes on with the union war effort is really, I think, the most interesting and important thing and maybe what people are most familiar with. So if I can skip ahead, um, Lincoln's elected. We know that happens. And like you yes. said, and we're, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of fast forward a little bit with Elmore Ellsworth and the Fires Zouaves in New York and how he becomes connected with them as with the regiment and then 
you know, the coming into the war effort well, that, and that, that, that sort of thing. So let's pick up there. Okay, that's, that's actually pretty easy to do. A regiment is a thousand men. And if you can recruit a thousand men, you become a colonel. And Ellsworth's chance at becoming an army officer uh, with Lincoln's backing hadn't gone so well. It turned out that it was um, uh, both he and Lincoln were just naive as to how you got promoted in the army. Mm -hmm. And he ran into Winfield Scott and uh, Winfield Scott pretty much had the militias taken care of. So um, Elmer Ellsworth is in Willard's hotel and comes down with what he thinks is smallpox. Turns out it's measles. He's caught it from uh, Willie and Tad Lincoln. And at that time, uh, while he's sick in the hotel, um, the John Hay and George Nicolay come by regularly and Sumter's fired upon and they say, come on, Elmer, you got to get up. You know, you got to you got to go get those firemen. And the reason he wanted the firemen is this. He knew that there wasn't going to be a lot of time to drill and get the army to, you know, to be bandbox perfect. Mm -hmm. And there might actually be fighting involved. Mm -hmm. So he figured, and rightly so, that. A firefighter knows how to fight a fire with a group, so can take his part within a group. And yet, when that's taken care of, he has the ability to look around and find the next problem mm. and then do it either alone or join into another group. So if you can picture a battle, you know, you've, you've fought off whoever it is, you turn around and you look, you know, the guy on the right of you is dead, but the guy on the left of you is taken off to the, you know, down the hill and you look up and hear the black horse cavalry's coming. So you follow him because that's what firefighters do. And so he figures the, he, the firefighters are going to be it. And uh, he goes to Lincoln. He says, you got to help me. Lincoln hands him a, a letter to Horace Greeley, the editor of the Tribune in New York. Greeley is, of course, a big Lincoln supporter. This mm -hmm. kid comes in, and but he's got the backing of everybody. And he goes, okay, go for it. You know, stop the presses. We're printing these uh, uh, broadsides. And within three days, um, uh, the firefighters, he had well over a thousand recruited. He had mm -hmm. so many recruited that the mayor of New York uh, kind of said, nah, you know, yeah, we'll give you a thousand, but we don't want to take all our firefighters. Um, he uh, got uniforms for them almost immediately. And yes, they were shoddy. Um, if people know about that scandal, but um, they look good at first. And uh, all the movers and shakers in uh, New York politics and uh, theater uh, came to see them off on the Baltic as they, they crossed the harbor and came into Washington to, uh, to, to join the Union Army. And they were sworn in by McDowell in front of the White House. And um, uh, the, one of the problems was there was no place for any of the units who were coming in to stay. They hadn't built the forts yet that mm -hmm. n even now ring Washington. Um, so uh, here you had not just the fire zouaves, but men from all over the, the Northeast. Uh, coming into New York, the fire zouaves were originally stationed in the, the Senate chambers. And mm. yeah, you know, being the fire zouaves, they put their ladders up and, you know, to the top of the chamber. And, mm. <laughs> yeah, caused, caused a lot of trouble. You know, it was a little drinking and carousing. And mm. Elmer just really laid down the law, only sent two people home, paid a lot of the fines himself. Hmm. And uh, so there's a fire at Willard's Hotel, a famous hotel, and uh, they think it's put out. The fire department in Washington thinks it's put out. Turns out it isn't. They call for the fire zouaves. The fire zouaves come. And at first, the fire marshal for Washington tries to tell them what to do. And Elmer says, that'll never work. And he grabs the fire horn and starts uh, telling his men what to do. And sure enough, the fire zouaves put out a fire at Willard's. And everybody's so impressed that now the fire zouaves are everybody's, you know, best loved unit. And mm. within two days, they also get to move out of Washington. So mm. <laughs> they don't get a chance to spoil that. 
Um, so all the volunteer forces leave and go to a variety of camps that, that surround Washington. They go to what they call um, Camp Lincoln. And um, it's there that they, they drill. And then on uh, the night of May 23rd, May 24th, Ellsworth asks, please, you know, let my guys um, be the first to uh, go into Alexandria. And the reason Alexandria is its proximity to Washington and the reason the 23rd, 24th is that although Virginia had voted to secede, they had to have that ratified by the people of Virginia before they could actually secede. And um, they knew when that election was, they being both the North and the South. And Lincoln basically calls up the uh, mayor of Alexandria and says, look, you know, I cannot let you guys be this close to Washington and not be under martial law. So as soon as that uh, uh, vote takes place and you guys secede, uh, I'm sending the army in and you're going to go under martial law and we'll set up the hospitals and blah, blah, blah. You know, there should be no fighting or anything like that. So no one was expecting any fighting. Um, and, uh, Elmer asked that his men be asked to be the vanguard. They got on boats, crossed the Potomac, and uh, in the middle of the night, it was a full moon, um, were asked to go to take a, a small unit of, uh, of men and go cut the uh, uh, Western Union line so that the Alexandria would no longer be able to have contact with the uh, Confederate Army. And... Uh, it's at this point that they go past the Marshall House Hotel, where the flag is. Um, do you want me to explain what happens there, or you know, yeah. who Jackson is, who, what, what the? Yeah, I, I think. Okay, I'll, um, I'll go on. Then I just didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's it, it's a story that some may be familiar with, but some 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 people watching tonight may not. Um, so. Again, uh, well, you know, my, we'll, we'll keep the, keep time the, in mind, but yeah, except what happens there, of course, is, is very important. Okay, so. well, James Jackson is the uh, he's a, a fire eater. You know, he's a young man of the family, and what he does for a living at this time is he's the proprietor of the Marshall House Hotel. He doesn't own it; he manages it, and it's a family hotel. You know, people lived in uh, hotels then, and then came down. It was you know had room and board. Um, his wife fixed dinner for everybody, etc. And he had asked one of the families living there, uh, the man was a sailmaker, ask him to make a flag. And he made a flag mm -hmm. of the stars and bars. And in the canton where the, the stars are, he said, okay, leave that blank and we'll put a star in for every uh, state that secedes from the union. And uh, the, it ends up making a circle of stars with the middle left blank and the big star that goes in there will be when Virginia secedes. Now, this is no little flag. This is an 18 by 24 foot flag. Oh, wow. And it's made out of sailcloth. So it's very heavy. And it gets taken up and put, you know, put up and pulled down, put up and pulled down every time something happens. And um, it's up and the uh, big star is in it. And uh, all the partying's over with, and uh, uh, James Jackson and his family are in bed, and uh, Elmer Ellsworth and his group of about seven or eight men come by the Marshall House. He looks up at the flag. Now, Lincoln could see that flag hmm. with, a, with a telescope from his office, from his office. Mm -hmm. And it always made him angry that such a huge flag was there. And Ellsworth, according to three or four people, walks by the flag, stops, turns around, looks back up at the flag, and then says, that flag has to come down. So he picks um, five or six men to stay with him, sends the rest of the unit to take care of the communications, and he goes into the Marshall House. Now, he does not break and enter the Marshall House. He knocks mm -hmm. on the door. Somebody answers. He says, is the proprietor there? The man says, uh, I don't know. I just woke up. And he said, well, we're, you know, you're under martial law. And so it's okay for him to enter 
the Marshall House. Mm-hmm. He, uh, it's a three-story um, hotel. He goes up to the first story, leaves uh, a soldier there, goes up the second story, leaves a soldier there on the landing of the stairs, goes up to the uh, top of the Marshall House, cuts down the flag with the, uh, you know, the halyards are cut with the uh, Bowie knives, and they all start back down. And it, like I said, it's huge flag, very heavy. And Elmer has it kind of draped over one arm, and it's dragging behind him. And um, uh, a couple of the newspaper reporters are trying to hold it up. And in front of Ellsworth is Private Frank Brownell, Francis Brownell. They get to the second floor landing. There's a man standing there in his uh, uh, nightshirt and pants. He has a double-barreled shotgun. He says, you know, let go of that flag. And Elmer doesn't even have time to turn. And the first shot from the shotgun is fired. It goes through Elmer Ellsworth's heart. And Mm -hmm. Elmer Ellsworth is killed immediately. Frank Brownell, of course, has a Springfield with a bayonet. He extends the bayonet, uh, pushes the shotgun to the side so that the second shot uh, goes awry. It hits the uh, wood above the door, and Brownell shoots Jackson uh, almost immediately after um, Ellsworth is shot. It's like bang, bang, and then uh, he does bayonet Jackson to make sure that uh, he wasn't sure it was a killing shot but you make sure Mm. that Jackson isn't going to bother anybody and then it's silent people are just astounded like wait what how did this happen yeah and this is May 23rd you said May 24th the the morning of May 24th yes so it's interesting to me too, that he's killed instantly. I think there's a yes. there's a certain aspect in what follows that I think would have gone differently if he had hung around for four weeks in the hospital or died of infection because his arm had been amputated, oh. something along those lines. You know, like other famous <clears throat> Civil War figures. <laughs> um, so I, I, even the manner of his death, I think, con- is probably a contributing factor to the to the shock and the and the. And the reaction I, I that people have. I definitely to. agree with that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and and the fact that it just everything happened so quickly, and both men are just dead, just out and out dead. Yeah. You know, no one's going. Uh, nothing like that. Dead. You know, um, it, the the Zouaves who were there are in shock. Um, the uh, second in command sends a group of them to get the doctor. Uh, Dr. Gray, who is with the Zouaves. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, why, there they go now. <laughs> um, uh, and the Zouaves that are there pick Elmer Ellsworth's body up and carry him to a room that is empty and put him on a bed. And they use the flag that he was carrying to mop his face and to clean him up as well as they could. They said his face looked fine. Uh, in fact, he looked just like he was asleep. Mm-hmm. And they they wait. Gray comes and, you know, pronounces him dead. And he's uh, carried back to the, the wharf in Alexandria. But because the fire zoobs are the fire zoobs, during the time that the doctor and a couple of other people have come to uh, into Alexandria to see what's happened, the fire zoobs are suddenly out of nowhere the middle of the night or the early morning, herded back onto a boat and taken out to the middle of the Potomac so that mm. they wouldn't go nuts and, you know, destroy all of Alexandria for killing, yeah. um, killing their, their colonel. He was very well loved by his mm. men. Well, that's, a, that's uh, an interesting part. You've, you've, you've talked about how kind of nice a guy he was. And so many of these early war uh figures turn out to not be particularly like well-loved guys you imagine them being very stern and i mean all all those men who are majors and colonels and captains at the outset of the war who become generals later on you know all of those guys are there you you wouldn't want to have them over for ice cream (laughs) um and that's an interesting (laughs) aspect of him because 
he looks he looks he looks like he would be a a, a severe kind of leader in a way the way he poses in the photos and he's so like picturesque in his you know in the images of him or the <laughs> engravings of him so it's kind of interesting to hear of him as a is that beloved a, a, a leader because you don't expect it from a drill master type guy like that uh, that he's well I think that um, th they always say uh, even John Hay said that he himself was everything he wanted everybody else to be hmm. That he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't visit whorehouses, he didn't go to bars or pool rooms. Uh, if if there was going to be a practice, he was there an hour before the practice and stayed an hour after the practice. That he didn't ask anybody to do something he wouldn't do himself. And when he made promises, the promises were kept. Um, I know that mm -hmm. after... Ellsworth's death and the problems with the uniforms. One of the things that the fire zoobs, well, the 11th New York was angry about was that the uniforms they had been promised had fallen apart and the new ones didn't materialize. The guns they had been promised uh, weren't showing up in, uh, in enough numbers to be given to everybody. And they were being given Springfields and all this, um, the zoobs kept saying, you know, if, if Ellsworth were here, this wouldn't be happening. He would take care of us, mm -hmm. and he always he always took care of, of his men and um, uh, took care of his friends and held himself to a very exacting standard. But I say I think he was just an an incredible person. Mm -hmm. I I don't see how he could have been friends with all the people that he knew mm -hmm. and who respected him if he had been. A jerk. Yeah. I know that, uh, and and this shouldn't be taken. Uh, I I shouldn't have said that before. Um, when I taught in California, I taught what we call Title One schools, and that means that you know eighty percent of your kids get free lunch. So I've taught children of poverty most of my professional life, and I know what children of poverty have to go through, and they don't often make a terrific impression at the age of 14 on somebody who wants them to come to New York and work in their uh, store. You know, sure. they don't often get the daughter of the town banker to fall in love with them. There must be something more to Ellsworth. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that indeed there was that uh, yeah. it was the, the consistency of attitude, the, the, Christianity, the fairness. I, th I think he just was raised um, beautifully by his parents. You know, yeah. he was responsible. He was just all of the things you would want your son to be. Hmm. So I'm going to, again, skip over something here that's Im important part of him. But by Meg's book, if you can get all of it. Uh, we don't want to completely <laughs> give away everything here tonight anyway, but we are getting close to an hour here. And I do want to discuss the, the legacy of his death a little bit. Um, so he does, of course, uh, he lies in state. There's impact er, in the white house. There's a great impact on the Lincolns themselves from his death. And then his body is, is toured on its way back to where it's buried or where he's buried, very similar to what we more familiar with Abraham Lincoln later. Well, it, go, um, it goes, it goes up the Hudson yeah. uh, to Albany. And okay. lies in state there. In the and capital? Then it, yes. Okay. And then it goes across to Mechanicville yeah. in upstate New York. I see. So um, now the figure that he becomes, he's obviously the first officer to die in the war. He becomes a martyr figure. Uh, so does the man who shot him to the South, but not to the same degree. The South doesn't rally around him nearly the way uh, that the North rallies around Ellsworth and, you know, avenge Ellsworth and the letterheads and all the things that we see. Um, and that's what most of us know is that part of Ellsworth is after he's been killed. Um, so what made him in his death uh, handled the way it was by, by Northern society at that time? Because we were so, they were so naive to war at that point. Like somebody died of smallpox. They gave him a gigantic, 
you know, military burial and camp and everybody was grieving and the whole thing. For, so it was a different relationship to death, of course, that early in the war. Um, um, I think that Ellsworth is the sort of the last of the good death. There's a mm -hmm. concept in um, Victorian life where, uh, you know, when, when it comes to the end, you're supposed to die the good death. You, you lie in bed and all your family is around you and they're celebrating mm -hmm. a life well lived. And they kind of think that you're going to be, you know, angels are going to come and you're going immediately to heaven and, and that kind of thing. Um, and there's also the idea of, of war that a soldier couldn't die a bad death. I mean, he's a soldier. Hmm. So they, he becomes everybody's son. He's everybody's husband. He's hmm. everybody's brother. He's everybody's friend. And the whole North mourns what's happened to, to him. Hmm. And it, they're just stunned that this could have happened you know, to one so young, to one so, you know, with so much ahead of him. And then you turn around and you look at the guys in your hometown who are signing up to go to the Union Army and you think, these guys, they're all Ellsworth. Mm. You know, that they're young. They're, you know, they have their whole lives ahead of them. They're, you know, young fathers leaving uh, bereft families, uh, people getting married just before they go to war. Uh, you know, all the things that we think of now as part of the tragedy of uh, the beginning mm. of a war. Yeah. Um, and no one at this point is immune to death like they are, you know, by 1863 on. Sure, Not that sure. people become immune to death, but it's, it's, there's a different, yeah. different approach. I say he belongs, he belongs to the entire union at this point in time. The, the president is, is in tears over it yeah. uh, and it's oh, seen publicly in tears that's a good point we do have a question from tony grant who uh is watching from california he actually asked that exact question is how deep was lincoln's grief upon the death of death of ellsworth so just <laughs> i'll just interrupt your sentence there <laughs> to acknowledge okay. he was asking that actual question lincoln uh the, the lincolns had lost a son in uh springfield and Mrs. Lincoln was very upset about that. One of the things that Ellsworth was able to bring to the Lincolns was not exactly a replacement for Robert Lincoln, mm -hmm. but um, from what I've read, Robert Lincoln, I mean, they loved the Robert dearly, but he wasn't a hail fellow, well-met kind of guy. He was sort of taciturn and grumpy and, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, not always... Uh, a joy to his mother's heart and suddenly there's Ellsworth and Lincoln brings him home and here's this handsome guy with a joke for the you know for Willie and Tad uh, and you know always a piece of candy in his pocket and of course he's so handsome and I always figure he probably always smelled great you know like um, <laughs> at, you know kind of Victorian aftershave and he would flirt with Mrs. Lincoln and, mm -hmm. you know, take her hand. Um, he met Mrs. Lincoln in the, you know, in Springfield. He was the one that uh, President Lincoln picked, hand picked to save his family on their trip through Baltimore when Lincoln uh, left the train to go with Pinkerton and Ward Hill Lehman again um, uh, to sneak into Washington when they found out about the assassination plot. Um, then, uh, uh, so if he, if he has enough respect for Ellsworth to say, you need to take care of my family, boy, you know, you, you're mm -hmm. the one you're, you're my surrogate son here and I'm trusting you, you know, um, with everything I hold dear. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that shows a, a pretty, uh, pretty high regard for mm -hmm. Elmer Ellsworth. Um, sure. and of course the letter that Lincoln wrote to Ellsworth's family uh, says in no uncertain terms how highly regarded Ellsworth was by the Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. Lincoln. Um, and, uh, you know, you just, it, it brings tears to your eyes when you realize 
uh, was this is if if you're looking at it from Lincoln's point of view, he's mm -hmm. going to lose another son. He's going to lose one of his best friends at Ball's Bluff. I mean, it's going to be, you know, from Ellsworth's death on, it's going to be nonstop. And Lincoln himself says, you know, he feels every one of those deaths personally. Um, and Ellsworth's was the was the first and mm -hmm. uh, probably the was the first cut is the deepest. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was yeah. that was definitely, definitely true. Yeah. Um, and I think what what a guy Lincoln is. So what a guy Ellsworth must have been to yeah, yeah. be admired by such a man as Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. So with his, and, and interesting, I just want to, there's always a way to tie every bit of everything that happened in the Civil War to Seattle. So interestingly, <laughs> they didn't receive the news of Ed, Ellsworth's death until well into July of 1861, oh. because it took so long for the news to get here. Um, and there's an interesting thing because they, they print, uh, there's the earliest accounts are just, and they come in very chopped up. The, the Eastern reporting here, you know, they get it in uh, from a newspaper or it winds up, you know, getting up to telegraph to Portland and then it comes on paper. So the papers are often just almost like a scrapbook of what showed up yes. on the steamer. And then we put it all together and we printed it. So we see some really interesting perspectives on things from some Northern papers, Southern papers, sometimes, you know, political papers were very political in that era, and they usually oh, yeah. had a, a, a Republican or Democratic point of view. But here, they they were just grabbing for anything to put in there. And there's one interesting account I found this week when I was looking through it, and it comes from at a paper that was in New Orleans originally, um, and that it's printed here in Washington is actually really interesting. But they, well, there's some accounts of Ellsworth not many though it's not it doesn't hit here as hard as it probably did in Massachusetts or New York um, but it you know the story's written and then they account some they reprint something from the New York Tribune that's a thorough accounting of the story but this there's a story from New Orleans that says oh yeah poor Ellsworth we got to make sure that Butler in New Orleans gets it next <laughs> and so he's he's that's the first time where I've seen the the uh, a press actually kind of villainize him in a way and to be in a neutral place like Seattle where they're pulling it all in and it contrasts so much but I thought wow this even to the south he was a wasn't a martyr like like the man who shot him but he was a figure and he was you know a a, a factor in that that uh, well, he I don't was say greatly, propaganda greatly but respected. back and forth and, even Robert E. Lee said that he thought, and I completely disagree with Lee, but uh, he Lee said he thought that if he had lived, if Ellsworth had lived, he would have uh, uh, become the general of the Army of the Potomac, and um, wow. you know things like that. Now I don't, I don't know if Lee actually said it. I've seen it in several places, yeah. but I've never seen, you know, I've never talked to General Lee to ask him whether yeah. he actually said that or not. Well, there's a lot that of stuff not. that Lee said that's out there that this boy, I don't know, some pretty questionable <laughs> stuff. If it's not on paper in the official records. Or in a letter, I, I um, yeah, I'm skeptical of anything attributed to General Lee, but anything. Um, but I guess let's well, particularly when you when you know what happens with the Army of the Potomac. Here's Ellsworth, a Lincoln man to the marrow of his bones. The Army of the Potomac, not so much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's I don't true. really he think would... uh, that would have been his his future. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's so. a good point. So I guess just to end here, um, we haven't gotten any other questions other than that, that one from Tony, actually, um, about Lincoln. But what was your, do you feel like Ellsworth has gotten his due historically at this point? Or in your work with him, do you think that he's kind of one of those guys that sh should be more present in Civil War history than he is? Versus, okay. you, you know, you versus broke up a little famous, bit there. Oh, okay. Um, what's after having done the work that you did on Ellsworth? What's your your take on his standing historically as a, as a figure in the Civil War? Do you think he's represented appropriately, or or kind of swept under the rug a little bit in favor of talking about Lee and Grant and figures like that? 
or like well, how does how does he fall? I think that uh, I think that with his Civil War historians, uh, there's what we call um, the B, the B list, and mm -hmm. obviously that's not Lee and Grant, you know, sure, <laughs> or even sure, Sherman. Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's the 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 rest of the guys, and then there's um, ever since Hardtack and Coffee and uh, Billy Yank and Johnny Reb. There's mm -hmm. a lot of interest in the common soldier. Sure. And for me, the fact that Ellsworth was such an exceptional person in on mm -hmm. one side of the coin, and on the other side of the coin, he was so typical of the young men who wore the blue. Uh, in you know his devotion to his family, the small town, you know his personal experiences. His decision-making process, you know, wanting to do well, wanting to represent well, um, being of the first generation that really didn't go into the family business, uh, you know, left home for the first time. You mm -hmm. have to remember, this isn't that far from the revolution. His uh, grandfather was uh, in the revolution. Mm -hmm. um, it was, um, he's just a pivotal figure for me for those reasons i have been asked if ellsworth had lived what do i think would have been his role mm -hmm. um there were famous cavalry people who totally changed the way cavalry was used mm -hmm. there were famous artillery people who totally changed the way artillery was used but there was no one who changed the way infantry was used and it was going through a sea change from Napoleonic tactics um, to forward to, you know, what we might mm. more normally recognize as warfare now. Um, and we had a few, you know, we had Berdan sharpshooters, things like that. I think it would have been Ellsworth's tactics, his strategy and tactics hmm. that would have made the difference might have taken a year off the war so that nobody's standing in a line waiting to be shot. Many of the things you see in basic training films now, and I, I, I'm going to end with this. Um, one of the things that the Zouav cadets did that always brought down the house um, was they would put up a wall and then one man would kneel by the wall another man would climb to the top of that man another time another guy would climb to the top of that man and then they built a human pyramid and got everybody in the unit all 50 men over the mm. wall using guns using gymnastics using all of that yeah and that's always sort of presented as a parlor trick mm. but i was watching um videos of um i believe it was navy seals mm -hmm. and they were doing the crawl on their elbows which mm -hmm. is directly from the zouave drill mm -hmm. they were doing a three-man shooting thing where one man is the one who fires a shot two men and back reload and and you know check the gun so that it's firing all the time nobody has to wait to reload and at the last, they the men were going over the wall. And, you know, yeah, I got pretty teary mm. to see that, that th those, those parts of, of the drill of the, the best of us, our warriors, um, can trace their antecedents directly mm. to Elmer Ellsworth. I, I just... Um, I got goosebumps, I got feels, I got tears, yeah. I got all of those things to yeah. think what what kind of an impact uh, he might have had uh -huh. uh, on on the Union Army and the formation of Union Army uh, strategy yeah. and tactics. And, that's uh, that's interesting because we have um, there's a one of Seattle's veterans was a captain in a Chicago artillery battery in the Western Theater, and after the war he used to go to uh, I think Army of the Tennessee reunions or something like that. And he was asked to speak specifically, and this goes right to what you were just saying, mm -hmm. by General Sherman to speak on this topic, which is why he had a lower casualty rate in his artillery battery 
than any other battery in the entire army. And this man, William Rumsey, he specifically references that I okay, used yeah. Zuov drill tactics in my artillery battery. And he's got to be the only one. And he had to have been influenced on that via coming from Chicago uh, yes. as an artillery yes. commander. So they would fire. It, this was battery B of the first Illinois light artillery, Chicago light artillery. They would fire and they would lay down. The men yes. that were loading and swabbing the rifle would lay down and they had this whole system worked out and they suffered 10% of the casualties of any of the other batteries that were attached with in that period of combat. And Sherman wanted to know about that after the war. He was like, you need to talk to people. You need to present what you did. Cause he was thinking coming from probably that Ellsworth Zouave school out of Chicago. So to your point, it, 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 you, you can find little bits that like even that, even William Rumsey, who was a very, came from very influential Chicago legal family, the, the, the connections are there. Um, and, and you could see if that potential was more widespread, how, how that may have changed I, artillery as well. I, I think it would have made an incredible difference. Um, there was a reason why the Zouaves were so well known in the Crimean War. And it was their tactics. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ellsworth was able to combine uh, regular army tactics with the Zouave tactics, uh, made changes in the uniform that made it easier to uh, maneuver. Uh, and you were talking about the guys lying down. No one's really lying down. Everybody is, they may be prone, but they're oh, yeah. still doing what they need to do to continue to have that, that yeah. gun work. Precisely. Yeah. 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 I, I guess laying down is a little simpler uh, language well, I, I I know have, that I should have used, but I know I, to your point, yes, it was an active thing, but it was, it was innovative and it was different. And yeah. Had, yes. it, had Ellsworth's influence been longer lasting and more widespread than men like Rumsey with what he was doing with an artillery battery would have more traction with leadership in the Western theater. And, um, and, and yeah, so again, it took us a lot longer to learn these tactics, but, but you're right. They all, you know, you, you can really, yeah. And I think, I think Lincoln would have, Lincoln would have kept him close. He would have kept him in Washington and they, you know, every soldier that came out of the training, uh, training camps in Washington would have been uh, good to go as they say. Well, I'd like to say thanks to everyone watching tonight. Um, and thanks for, we got a late start and uh, thanks. We had a nice, a nice number of people viewing tonight and I know it's tough with the news cycle and everything that's going on. So I hope you guys enjoyed a little hour of going back to the 19th century to get out of the 21st century <laughs> for a bit here. Um, and, and I want to thank everybody for watching uh, and thank, of course, Meg for coming on. And oh, my I pleasure. Highly recommend uh, you get the book. I've had the chance to read most of it, not not in its entirety yet, uh, but it's great. It has lots of really great uh, old photos uh, that I haven't seen elsewhere. Uh, a picture of the of the flag uh, that we started off with from from um, Alexandria and all that. So, uh, if you liked what you heard tonight, uh, definitely go out and pick up the book and and. Uh, so I think we'll wrap it up there, you guys. Again, thanks for watching, and uh, thank you, Meg, for coming on. And hopefully we can do this again in the future with some different topics because I think we could probably pick anything in the war and go on for an hour about it. So uh, <laughs> At least. hopefully you'll, you'll join us again. So all right, well, we're going to sign off here, you guys. Thanks for watching again, and, uh, and have a good night. Take care.